Dr. Anna Laura Ortega Biggs is a psychologist out in California, and I interviewed her on episode six of this podcast where we talked a bit about um, just finding empowerment in your medical care and in your social circles, especially as you're going through really difficult times. And last time that Dr. Anna was on the podcast, she was going through some health issues. There was a lot of confusion around what she was going through, and I know that a lot of us experience that same situation. So Dr. Anna came back and we recorded an episode, honestly, a few months ago at this point, but um, it's been a while since I've been able to edit and stay consistent with uploading podcasts. So I am uploading her episode today, um, and yesterday we actually recapped again, um, because in this whole episode you'll hear that she's talking to me pre-surgery. And then she gave a kind of 15, 20 minute um, update post-surgery. So I'm excited for this episode because we haven't really done something like this before. We talk a lot about kind of stories, personal stories, and um, you get to hear from therapists of all different kinds and and what they've been through. But this one is really in real time. Um, So Dr. Anna has been incredibly gracious in sharing her real time story with us. And I hope that you all get a lot out of it. Also, I wanted to be really clear here, we both wanted to be clear, that while we are using the term women, we really are talking about anybody who identifies in any minority group. Um, Historically, you know, history will talk about men, women, men, women, but just keep in mind that anyone who is gay, lesbian, transgender, anything other than cis, hetero, white, basically was lumped into in the history, they were just completely left out um, or lumped into this group called women. Uh, So we use the term women here, but this really is inclusive to anyone who has any identity frame. The Chronic Illness Therapist podcast is meant to be a place where people with chronic illnesses can come to feel heard, seen, and safe while listening to mental health therapists and other medical professionals talk about the realities of treating difficult conditions. This might be a new concept for you, one in which you never have to worry about someone inferring that it's all in your head. We dive deep into the human side of treating complex medical conditions and help you find professionals that leave you feeling hopeful for the future. I hope you love what you learn here, and please consider leaving a review or sharing this podcast with someone you love. This podcast is meant for educational purposes only. For specific questions related to your unique circumstances, please contact a licensed medical professional in your state of residence. I am really glad to see you here. I'm curious, um, what prompted you to want to talk today? Like, was there something specific on your mind that you you wanted to go into? Yeah. (laughs) So I, uh, since we last spoke, which I just, I re listened to that. I think that was January 5th of 2021. Does that sound, or was it 2022? 2022. Yes. 2022. So, so much has happened since then. And I was recognizing that when I was listening back to, to our first podcast, I had really minimized unknowingly, I think, and really invalidated what was going on for me medically and with my own things that were that I was sort of navigating. And I think um, a lot of that has to do with just being gaslighted by <laughs> multiple um, medical professionals. And I've since come to learn a lot more about what I've been living with and, and dealing with for so many years of my life. And I'm becoming even more passionate about it. Um, and I, I want to provide good information so that people can get quality care. I, I remember um, also last time we talked, you were experiencing 
I think a lot of grief, a lot of death in your family. Mm-hmm. And I'm, yes. yeah, yes. I would imagine all of this is connected, right? Because nothing lives in isolation. Sure. I mean, I haven't necessarily recently connected all that because I think when we were speaking, it was just still, you know, the height of, of COVID. And um, I also, at that moment in time too, I was, I was pretty deeply in experiencing postpartum depression with my second child. And I think there was just so much happening and I was probably a little bit removed from what I was experiencing emotionally. I was really just trying to survive, which I think I've probably been trying to do for a really long time. And I think I've gotten good at that and didn't really recognize that within myself. I, I can see it and identify it so easily in, in the work that I do with my patients and particularly within the you know population of chronically medically ill women. I think that they're very good. We are very good at um, presenting like we're doing a lot better than we are. And so, yeah, I think there's just so many updates to what's happening with me. And I felt like it warranted a conversation around women's health and the way that it's navigated and with particular focus today on endometriosis um, and adenomyosis. But I think more so the endometriosis part of things, just because there's much more that can be done there than there is for adenomyosis, which is also obviously a women's health issue um, that needs to be discussed as well. But there's a lot to happen for me in the next 10 days. And so I just really wanted to connect with you and connect with women that might be going through similar things or looking for answers. Uh, And I wanted to be one place that they can find evidence-based information um and maybe just process some of the the grief and the rage that accompanies these really frustrating diagnoses so i'm so glad you brought up rage and i think we definitely need to talk about that later on in this episode but first can you talk a little bit about you know endo and i don't know and how maybe some of your gaslighting experience and how you ended up into getting the diagnosis and that kind of, that part of your journey. Yes. Uh, so I feel like whenever you have probably, I think anything in women's health, but any of these sort of, you know, pelvic <laughs> related diseases that uh, you could probably spend eight hours talking about all of the, the, you know, care or just your symptoms. And when you first noticed, and I think for me, it's been a lot of going back and realizing that things that I didn't realize were connected were absolutely connected. So what I'll say is that uh, when I first, you know, got my period at 13, I mean, I think a lot of the signs and symptoms were there, but I just didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and I wasn't, I mean, I, I really love my family, but I did grow up in a house where I think, you know, up until recently, like vagina was a bad word or, you know, it's something that my family didn't, I mean, they still kind of cringe when I forcefully make them say it, you know, um, and vulva and these kinds of things. I mean, I didn't even know that word, I think until later into adulthood. And that's just insane to me, but, um, it just wasn't, I didn't, I don't think that it felt really comfortable for me to talk about these things and ask these questions. Not that my family isn't really safe and loving and supportive, but maybe around these kinds of things, it just wasn't really the culture of my, my home. And so my periods. Yeah. I just wanted to add in there, you know, when things are unknown, they're unsafe. And so it sounds like, yeah, you've got a supportive family. They loved you. But if we don't even have the language to talk about our body parts, then the whole thing feels unsafe. And we just try to like kind of stay at an arm's distance from it. Sure. Yeah. And if you don't, I mean, if it's not really being discussed, you don't know what is, is normal or healthy, you know, and at school, I mean, we, you don't, I don't even have to go into the specifics to indicate that the education around these things at school, especially back then. um, I mean, I'm sure even now, but when I was 13, it was just not what it needed to be. Um, And sadly, I imagine that's probably still the case. And especially depending on what state you live in, I am in California, um, which is probably one of the more progressive states in that department. But even still, I imagine 
we're just not where we need to be. Um, so yeah, my periods were, they were quite uh, intense. They were, they would last about two weeks long. The bleeding was really, really um, excessive. And I didn't know that my cramps were really painful and it just felt like, oh, this is just how it goes. This is part of it. And around age 14 or so, I started experiencing pain in my left side, which I now understand was my ovary. And I was feeling myself ovulate, which I've since learned is actually not normal. Um, it's, it's really abnormal to be able to feel yourself ovulate, but I can tell you the second it starts happening, I can tell you when I'm ovulating, <laughs> you know, it's like that intense. I'm that aware of my body and I was feeling all this pain. Um, and, and so and just cause I take a somatic approach, my curiosity is around some of the sensations there. I'm curious for, is, so people can kind of get an understanding for themselves too. What kind of sensations did you feel that you now know weren't normal? just a sharp pain right where near where my ovary is, which I think when I was 13, 14, I didn't really even know what an ovary was or exactly where it even was in my body or that, you know, I wasn't supposed to feel that. And when I went to the doctor, she just said, Oh, that's just, she's just probably ovulating. She's fine. And that kind of started, that was my first experience with a gynecologist. I remember being very anxious. I'm not um, comfortable with nudity um, in general. And that, again, that really comes from, the, the modest sort of culture I was raised in um, with my family. And so uh, I think all of that was just, it was scary for me to explore those things. And it made me really uncomfortable with doctors and those kinds of appointments. And I think that also led to a pattern of avoidance where if I needed to, to navigate something that was happening in my body, I would avoid it at all costs because I was pretty fearful of procedures and doctors and pain um, you know, and it was accompanied with a lot of anxiety, which I think would exacerbate the treatment that I would receive because then it was so easy for them to go to, she's just a really anxious person. And all of this is just anxiety, which is, you know, there's a lot of historical implications for that, for women around hysteria and, um, that we aren't taken seriously and our pain isn't taken seriously, especially if we're women of color and particularly black women, um, do not, you know, they're just not taken seriously. And that leads to a lot of really dangerous uh, complications, um, including death, which is just terrible. Uh, so essentially my story kind of continues where this was kind of my life for most of, you know, my adolescence, you know, young adulthood. And it really wasn't until I became a postdoctoral fellow um, at a hospital in Los Angeles, uh, which was really eye-opening for me. And it made me very aware of what was happening in my own body. And I was exposed to diagnoses that I had never really heard before. Maybe I had heard, but I just hadn't really registered um, that it was applicable to me. And so as the, you know, the the, the psychological consultant in behavioral medicine and this particular hospital, which is a hospital that, you know, it's, it's poverty medicine. So these are, these are the population that, that served there was predominantly monolingual undocumented Spanish speakers. And I, I'm a native Spanish speaker. I'm from Argentina. Originally I'm an immigrant. So I speak Spanish. So I was able to provide those services um, in, in their native language. And, um, what I saw horrified me. These women were in so much pain. And essentially what they were being told is really there's nothing else we can do for you. And there was an annoyance, um, which I, I now also really understand as I think uh, an exasperation on the medical side, because these doctors, when they learn about endometriosis, their medical textbooks have one sentence about endometriosis and it's not even accurate. And so they're not even learning about these things, which impact one out of 10 women that we know of so far. Um, I'm sure there are more, I, I, well, I'm, I shouldn't say that with such certainty, but I would imagine there are more cases than what we know about worldwide. Um, it has been largely sort of seen as a white woman's diagnosis um, and that's because that's who's getting care for it. 
Um, and that's who's making noise. And when white women make noise about things, then people tend to listen a little bit better. But, um, you know, I was watching women in so much pain, so exasperated, basically begging me for help. And they were being accused of drug seeking by a lot of these doctors or, or the doctors, if they weren't accusing them of that, and they were trying to be empathic and helpful, they just didn't know what else to do for them. And the problem was, is these women weren't receiving what they needed, which was excision of their endometriosis. They were either probably getting ablation or being put on things like Lupron, which just creates an even bigger problem. Um, and, and creates many new and, and, and worse problems. Um, so, uh, so that was sort of my intro to this world. And I got to see things behind the scenes. And it was the first time that I realized I don't trust the medical community the way that I grew up thinking that I should. The other piece of this that complicated things for me is that when I was a fellow, I was required to wear a white lab coat when I was in the hospital. And the way that people treated me with so much respect when I was wearing this stupid coat, when I didn't deserve it, I was, I mean, I was just a young fellow. I mean, I was smart and I knew some things, but I really didn't know much or a lot and definitely didn't, it didn't warrant the level of respect that people gave me. Uh, and that was really powerful for me because it showed me, you know, now I'm being called doctor for the first time and I'm wearing this coat and it, it makes people feel like I know what I'm talking about or I should, or that, that I have some sort of authority and that I should be listened to without being questioned. And particularly from cultures where being submissive or, you know, being respecting people in positions of power, particularly, you know, in this country, um, it's, it was really shocking to me and it has stayed with me and has allowed me to be mindful of when I might be sort of bewitched by somebody with a fancy letters and the, you know, behind their name or wearing these tools or these, you know, coats. And it makes you feel like you're in the company of someone that really is an expert and perhaps they're not. And I've now since learned that most most gynecologists don't know, they're not only not experts, but they really know less than many of most or many of their patients do about what's happening inside their bodies. Um, and that is, uh, I don't know. I don't know what word I think rage inducing <laughs> is the right yeah. word. I, probably there's a lot of different words you could use to describe what that makes me feel, but. Um, Why do you think this is? Why do we know, other than the fact that we're living a lot of, the, you know, we're living with these experiences, but I think it's a systemic issue. I mean, I think that the system is set up for research to predominantly focus on men um, and men's health. And that's why there's so many solutions for so many men of men's ailments. And then those things are being used on women. And it doesn't work for us because we have different hormones. We have different you know, things in our bodies, and I'm clearly not a medical doctor, so I won't, you know, <laughs> I won't dive into something that I, I also don't know anything about. But something that has, you know, that stayed with me is as a psychologist, I know a lot of things about certain areas of psychology. And then there's a lot of areas about psychology that you should definitely not come see me for, because I don't know what I'm doing. And if somebody does come to me or calls me and says, I'd love to work with you, here's the problem that I'm having. And I know that I don't know enough about that, or I know someone who knows a lot more and would be a better fit, then ethically, it is my job to say, I would love to work with you, but I think there's a better fit for you. Or you know what? that's outside of the scope of my practice. I'm not an expert in that, but Hey, there's somebody just, you know, down the street here, who's a colleague of mine and they're fantastic. And they know a lot about that thing or these issues. Right. And so, um, I think that too, it's like not even just about spending your time learning more textbook knowledge, but also just making connections, you know, networking right. and that's, that's like a yeah. human, a human, um, human connections. Right. Well, and advocacy, and I mean, there's so there's so much that needs to be done. I mean, it's exhausting to really think about, and I certainly am not purporting to have the answers to this, that I know what needs to be done. I just know it's, this isn't working, and doctors 
are failing us, the system's failing us, insurance fails us. There's so many uh, intersections here between, you know, racism, sexism, misogyny, um, you know, just socioeconomic status. I mean, when I think about my case, my case is really not unique. It's not special. I'm not, my case isn't interesting or different than the rest of the cases in this. If anything, it's probably less dramatic and intense than so many others. And I have privilege and access to, you know, so many resources and, you know, money as needed. And um, my level of education is really high. And even with that, I still got screwed by a system. Um, and so it makes me think, wow, if I come into these appointments with all of this knowledge, with all of this access to, you know, colleagues who are medical doctors, training in all these areas, um, I can advocate for myself. You know, I'm also not shy about using my voice. I'm not shy about being confrontational. And still, this happened to me. And I know we haven't even sort of completed kind of my story in terms of my journey of, of my diagnosis, but um, it it's alarming to me and I feel like it has lit a fire in me to be, to hold a megaphone as often as I can. And that's also part of why I really wanted to do this podcast today and just check back in with you because I feel like these conversations need to be accessible to as many people as possible. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I'm really glad you're feeling up for talking about it and that you are here talking about it. And I'm curious, yeah, what, what is kind of the next part of your journey and maybe some of the things that went right and went wrong uh, to get there? Yeah, essentially at that time, I became really attuned to what was happening. I remember speaking to my supervisor. Um, my supervisor was a very unhealthy person emotionally. Um, it was actually fairly abusive. Uh, to, to me and to other fellows, um, sort of historically, I kind of learned that later, but she, she actually was kind of the start of that minimization where she sort of said, oh, it's really common as a fellow here to start thinking that you have things in your body um, that are going wrong and it's really just kind of in your head. So that was the first time that sort of put it in my mind of like, oh, maybe I am just sort of a little bit of a hypochondriac, um, which in fairness has been sort of the running narrative about me since I was a small child. I think I was sort of set up for people to not believe that I was really in a lot of pain or my pain was seen as being experienced in a way that was excessive and probably not, um, not what's the word, uh, compatible with what was happening. Uh, and so I think I also learned to deny a bit of my own pain and see myself as just fearful. Um, and I think that it was a little bit of both and, right? That I was fearful and I did have more anxiety about medical things. And we sort of talked about that in the first podcast that I hadn't seen myself as someone that could even really listen to hearing about other people's pain because I would feel it so intensely if I'm kind of like an, you know, an empath uh, sort of way of, of feeling things the way people feel them. Um, I really want to, yeah, no, I think this is so important because um, so I grew up with my mom, everyone called her hypochondriac my whole life. And I, you know, I have had, had a lot of anger towards my mom for being this way. So when I started to feel pain in my own body, I was like, oh no, like this is, this is in my head. Like I'm turning out to be just like her. Like, and now I realize that those of us who are called hypochondriac have an extra sensitivity to pain because there is something genuinely happening inside of our body. It doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, you're, you absolutely have some kind of chronic illness, but we have a, just a heightened sensitivity to pain. Um, and then when you have a society that's like, no, that wasn't, tr that's not what's happening or, you know, no, this isn't true or, and they just minimize your experience, our fear centers and our brains say, no one's listening. So we have to shoot even higher. And so it's just, when I work with parents, I'm always trying to really bring home the point that validating their pain is always going to be the best solution. It doesn't matter if you think it's real. It doesn't matter what you think about it at all. If you deny it, you actually will make it worse. Absolutely. Well, and pain in our bodies is, it's a signal that something's wrong. So when your body's in pain, it's telling you, hey, something isn't right here. And 
I think pain is one of those things that it really is felt differently by different people. And it also changes as you experience different levels of pain, right? And so after having, you know, going through childbirth two times, um, I had really long labors. They were like 30 plus hours and I pushed for four hours um, with both babies. So I now think I have a, a different pain tolerance than I did, you know, a few years ago. Um, or a different experience of what my body can handle. Um, and so, yeah, pain, it's all relative, right? I mean, I remember my brother-in-law got in a car crash, or I'm sorry, he was hit by a car. And when he got to the hospital, they asked him what his pain was, and he said a four. And I remember he was really celebrated for that, of like, wow, what high pain tolerance. And I remember really rejecting that and saying, why are we celebrating that because a was he possibly minimizing his pain because of you know toxic masculinity <laughs> or or does he just have a different tolerance of pain and and does it is it it should it be celebrated or should it just be sort of this neutral like oh, okay you're a four and for you that means this and if you were at a seven that would mean that somebody was cutting off your head or something i don't know i mean it's just it's such a strange system to rate pain that way. I always tell doctors I'm at an 11. <laughs> They're like one out of 10. I always just add a number to the chart. I'm like, it's an 11. Just, you know, it's really high. Um, yeah. I, I have the yeah. last episode that just aired before this last Friday was called the pain scales bullshit. And I had Nadia Klontz on and we just talked about that the whole time. And I did a talk uh, at a community, it was a community mental health agency and, but they have an interdisciplinary team and a hospital and very much lower socioeconomic status. And when I brought up the pain scale, like shouldn't even be used. I got so much pushback by the doctors in the room. Like they were, they were not happy with me and that's okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. But, um, yeah, it's just really, it's like, well, we want, we know we have, we have to use it for, um, to see like the start and the end, like progression of treatment. And I'm like, I didn't, I didn't argue too much because I was a speaker and I just felt, and it was through Zoom and I couldn't even see their faces. So it was just like a weird kind of talk. But my point to my comeback to that is like, how pain is up and down. There is no, like at the start of treatment, I'm a level 11 and now I'm a level two. So all good, good to go. Like it just doesn't work that way. Correct. It's yeah. And sometimes it's hard. It is a complicated and it's a, it is a problematic system. I think um, there's probably better ways of, of doing that, <sighs> but I don't, I'm, I'm trying to remember where we were at as far as, oh, I think I was just sort of telling you about um, my pain kind of being minimized or people sort of thinking, oh, she's a little bit of a hypochondriac. So I think they didn't think things were as serious with me because I, they felt like I tended to exaggerate anyways, and then things would just be fine. And so I started at this point, I was about 20. Let's see, how old was I? Like 29, 30, I want to say right in that ballpark. And, um, I started going to, I started being more proactive and I went to, to a, a gynecologist up in Long Beach and that was recommended. And I started telling them, you know, I have all this pain and, um, you know, I can't do this and I can't do normal things. You know, like sex was, is extremely painful for me to the point of just, I mean, I have so much avoidance about it because it's just, why would you want to do something that hurts so much when it's not really supposed to hurt? Um, and so, I would just be told, do you just need to relax? You need to just maybe have a glass of wine. Like alcohol was really pushed. I feel like in these settings of like, just drink a little and you'll be, you know, more tolerant to, to things. And um, you're just probably insane. just in pain because that you're resisting hurt. it. I know. And so I just thought, okay, what the heck? Something's wrong with me. You know, like something's wrong with me, maybe just from a psychological standpoint, because they're looking at me and they're, they're telling me everything's fine. Um, and that kind of persisted. And then I got married and I was trying to have a baby and I couldn't get pregnant and it didn't really fit with the narrative of the rest of my family's sort of pregnancy stories. It seemed like, you know, my grandmother had five children. My mom had the two of us pretty easily granted. She was a 
lot younger um, than I was when I started trying, but still it just felt like, you know, my sister, everybody was able to get pregnant fairly easily. And I just, I wasn't getting pregnant and I was worried. And so I went to a doctor here in San Diego. I had moved back to San Diego at this point. And this was the first doctor that listened to me. So I don't want to celebrate her too much because the story after that does not take a good turn, but, but I will say getting the diagnosis was such a, a freeing, liberating feeling. And I remember just feeling so much relief. Um, and I hear that all the time. I do hear that with, with, you know, the women that I work with, it's just a lot of them spend eight to 10 years just searching for a diagnosis and they're told it's just anxiety. It's just psychological for all these years. And then they finally get that diagnosis. And it's so such a relief, even though it should be terrifying in a lot of ways too, because now you're learning that something is seriously wrong. And yet it's, it's crazy to me how much relief comes from the knowing. Um, and so that happened for me. She did a laparoscopy. She found endometriosis, uh, which I had suspected. So it felt nice to know, Hey, I'm not, you know, crazy. And I know my body and I was right. So at, at that point, she also told me, you know, your uterus looks quote, beautiful. Your fallopian tubes are clear. So you should be able to get pregnant. Um, you just have a little bit of endo in this area. It's not that bad. I didn't touch it because if I touch it, it makes your infertility become, a, you know, it can make you infertile. Um, and so, okay. So I thought, okay, well, she listened to me. What a great doctor, you know? So I believed her. So I went and continued trying to get pregnant, trying, 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 nothing was working. Spent a good two years in that boat. I finally went to a reproductive endocrinologist and continued there. I went through four IUIs, um, which is intrauterine inseminations. Those did not work. At that point, my RE, uh, he suspected adenomyosis. He knew I had endo, but he didn't do much about that because my doc, my other doctor who's in the same building as him had already confirmed it and kind of said, it's fine. It's not a big deal. So he looked on a transvaginal ultrasound and found something suspicious, which was um, not common. Usually you don't really pick that up on a transvaginal ultrasound. So it was good on him. Another sort of good moment. I can sort of appreciate that he found this because I don't know that it would have been found otherwise. He sent me for an MRI and it was confirmed, you know, to the point that it can be because with adenomyosis, really the only way you can fully confirm it is when you remove the uterus and biopsy it to confirm, right? And so, but it's essentially it's, it's at this point, it's been triple sort of confirmed of, yes, you definitely have this. Um, he's, he noticed my uterus was a lot larger than it should be. Um, it was also, it is also retroverted, which you'll hear that that's common and that, you know, it's kind of like a, a, an innie or an outie belly button, which I've since learned is not true. If you have a retroverted uterus, that's often a sign that something's wrong. Um, often it's an endometriosis related thing where it's being pulled back and tipped back or, or it could be another thing like fibroids or something. Um, and so, so that that's, you know, a new, it's sort of a new development that I didn't know. Um, and at that point, I just assumed, well, that's why I couldn't get pregnant. Um, and, and that could very well have also been the problem. Uh, I did, I went to IVF at that point, and I was, I was very lucky that both times with both babies, it worked on the first transfer and I was able to, you know, get pregnant and, and carry both babies to term and, and have sort of, you know, healthy babies. So that part ended well for me. Um, and then after that, I started doing a ton of research. That's where I found Nancy's Nook um, on Facebook. I'm no longer on Facebook, but um, I started to learn a lot about endometriosis and found that everything that I'd been learning online was utter garbage. And then I started to realize, hey, this gynecologist that did this surgery didn't do it right. And thankfully she didn't touch it because if she had, she would have used ablation and that would not have helped me at all. Um, so this is where the story gets a little complicated. Sorry. Yeah, just real quick, do you know, and it's okay if you don't know, because again, you're, you're not a, a doctor, but from your experience, um, what would have, it, was there something that she could have used that, that was an ablation that would have helped or not touching it was what, like, yeah, what was? So, I mean, so the, okay, the, the answer is a little complicated because yes, there is, but it wouldn't be good for her to do it because she doesn't know what she's doing. So 
you only want to go to a doctor that actually knows how to do this surgery. And the last time I checked and somebody can, can correct me and if people write comments on these, I don't know. Um, I welcome that feedback because I, I just know what I know and to the best of my ability. And I'm sure some of this is incorrect. So I, I welcome being told that, but uh, last I checked, there's roughly 50 to a hundred doctors worldwide that can actually do this surgery properly. It's called excision surgery. It's done um, usually robotically and um, it's, it takes a really special sort of trained eye to see the adhesions because some of these adhesions are not obvious. They're different colors. Some are black, some are white, some are really, really subtle that if you don't know this disease well enough, then you would completely miss it, which is what happened in my case. So, so what she should have done if she knew what she was doing was do excision surgery while she did the laparoscopy. So, and the way I just said that is confusing. Excision surgery is done laparoscopy. Um, but my point was that often women that have this, you sort of get the diagnosis the day you get the excision surgery. So it's sort of weird because you can, you can somewhat in certain cases, pick it up via a transvaginal ultrasound um, or other means, but it's, you often can miss it that way, or you can't see the full picture. So the really, the only way to, to really properly diagnose it and sort of the gold standard is to, to diagnose it via laparoscopy. And if you do that with a trained excision surgeon, they can both do that and then remove it in the same day, which is more beneficial because then you're not going through multiple surgeries because essentially what she did is just inflame the endo. She went in there, she caused a ton of inflammation and pain. And then I was worse off afterwards, but which I didn't know that. So what I've since come to learn is that, you know, once, once my, my, I have a almost two-year-old and an almost four-year-old. And so my goal was, you know, once I can kind of come up for air, I'm going to take care of my body and go, you know, deal with this, which I knew was going to be excision surgery for the endo and then a full hysterectomy for the adenomyosis. And I'm done having That's children. actually really important, I think, to maybe pause on, like, that you mm -hmm. made this decision to allow yourself to wait until maybe the timing was a little bit better because I think a part of like pain and fear and some of the mental health side of this stuff is like we can get into such fight or flight and I'm sure I mean you can talk more about your experience around that but I think too the ability to pause even though I'm sure you still had a lot of fear during that but to pause and to say like this is what's best for me in this moment this will be what's this other thing will be what's best for me in the next moment. And to kind of take it step by step is, is how we get through stuff like this. And that's what I preach on this podcast. And that's what I teach all my clients. And so I just wanted to kind of really illuminate that for a second. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, and it's tricky in my case, because now what I've learned is that I needed like, emergency care back in 2016 when I first got the first surgery. And so <laughs> <sighs> so it's this like, really, you, you didn't need to pause at all. You really needed it back then. But the yes. fact is you didn't have a doctor who knew or could educate you. You didn't know. And no, so then you had to it's completely wrong. Her whole, her whole, you know, thing was that when you get pregnant, it'll cure it. You just need to get pregnant, which is a really common. It's like the two things you'll hear or three is you need to relax, you need to drink a little and just get pregnant. And, you know, infertility is always the number one priority for doctors. They don't listen to women. There's young women that want full hysterectomies for whatever they might, whether it's fibroids or other things that they have, adenomyosis. And they're, they're not given that, that as an option because people sort of think, oh, you'll change your mind because they think that everyone just wants to have a baby. And the truth is a lot of people don't and that's okay. And people should be able to make decisions about their own bodies um, and they're not. In my case, I, fertility was important for me. So clearly like I wasn't going to have a hysterectomy for the adenomyosis because I was being told, yeah, you'll, you'll be able to safely carry a baby with this and yeah, you'll want to remove it later. Um, and then the flip side happens where with endometriosis, doctors think I'll just remove the uterus and all the things. And that's actually not, it, it's not what should be done. Um, it actually does not remove the endo. And um, it, there are certain cases where that is 
uh, an acceptable protocol to use, but that's actually quite rare with endo. With adenomyosis, it's the only option. With certain fibroids, it's also the only option currently, which also is not okay <laughs> because we should have more options, but the research isn't being done to provide us with alternative, you know, things that will that will cure us or help us or ease the pain or, you know, be safe. And so it's like, we're just removing all these organs, which has a lot of implications and leads to a lot of other complications and, and more things to have to deal with. Um, but in the case of endo, uh, if your doctor's saying, oh, we'll just remove all these organs, you should probably run <laughs> unless you have a really specific case that is so egregious, you know, Lena Dunham being one of those people. Um, she's a, a, a writer, producer, an actress, um, for those who haven't heard of her. And she, she's also kind of one of the, I read her book and then that's when I sort of saw a lot of myself in her story. Um, but her case was, was particularly intense and different than mine in so many ways, but Anyhow, I'm going on a tangent, but I want to be specific about this because I do, I hear of, I've had friends who have had hysterectomies for endo and it absolutely kills me because I know that they still have endo and now they had all these organs removed and they're dealing with hormone replacement therapy and all these things, um, which they didn't need to go through, especially at such a young age. Um, so, okay. So back to, I decide to get care. I, I prioritize myself again. That was kind of my big goal for, I turned 39 and now I'm 40. And I decided, you know, this is what, what I'm going to do. So in doing my research, I found, you know, there's only about 50, somewhere to between 50 to hundred of these, what, what they're called sort of nook surgeons. And that comes from Nancy's nook on Facebook. So these are sort of approved surgeons that have shown they actually do a really good job. They have a good success rate or high success rate at removing the disease. Um, where women either never need to go back for another surgery, or in some cases, maybe it grows back, but um, they, you know, are having living normal, happy lives again, pain-free lives. And so I found um, there were, there at, at the time that I looked, there were none in San Diego. There's one or two maybe in LA and really only one that I would recommend up in San Francisco, there are two listed, but one of them I, I would not recommend and I will not say their name because I don't want to be sued, but um, anyhow. Uh, and where can you find these lists like of the doctors worldwide? There, it's on Nancy's Nook. It's a group on Facebook that you have to join. Um, okay. There are some problematic things about Nancy's Nook, so I can't give it my full, you know, I fully 100% recommend it, but I will say that currently, it is one of the few places where you can find evidence-based information and you can find doctors that actually really do have expertise in treating this disease and removing it surgically um, via excision okay. surgery. So uh, there are some other political things I think happening there um, that I guess that's uh, to be expected in some ways. Um, so there are certain things I, uh, I'm being careful, as you can tell, and I think I sort of have to be, but so I'll just sort of keep it there. But I'd say uh, take it with a grain of salt, but that is one one area that I think you can find uh, valuable information to help you make informed decisions about your care. And so that you can go into these appointments ready to advocate for yourself and ask the proper questions you need to ask and um, so those kinds of things. Uh, yeah, I mean it's something we talk about too frequently here is like, unfortunately, and fortunately, we have to be our own researcher, our own doctor, sometimes our own, we want evidence-based care. We want the best care possible, but that does take sifting through some good and not so good information. So a lot of these tools are wonderful in, in the aid of that search, the aid in that search, but you just don't, don't ever take anything, Even, you know, your doctor did not have all the accurate information. A Facebook group is certainly not going to have every single accurate piece of information. So it really, unfortunately does take a lot of discernment, which is again, where I think we come in on the mental health side. How do we help you discern this in a way that allows you to trust your, your care team? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I did find a surgeon in Beverly Hills. Um, I did go to her. Um, she does not accept insurance. So everything was out of pocket. So again, I'm in a small population of people that was 
able to do that. And I have a lot of feelings about that. Um, the consultation went very well. I, I cried my entire drive home, but it was like tears of relief um, and gratitude really, because I felt so validated. Essentially, she saw that all my organs were being pushed to the left side of my body. Um, she also discovered another disease that is, is really, com it's a common comorbidity with endo. It's called SIBO, um, which stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And I really don't understand a lot about it. So I won't say more than that, but it really explained a lot of the symptoms that I was having with like bowel movements and things like that, which is really common with, um, people who suffer from endometriosis. So yeah, I, I had SIBO or did you, have you since recovered from that part, portion of it? Uh, I mean, so I was, <laughs> so I, I saw a gastroenterologist out of pocket, um, also in Beverly Hills who gave me the prescription, the antibiotics that you need to take, which is Zyfaxin and Neomycin. Those can be difficult. It's difficult often to get coverage for those. If you don't get covered, they can cost you up to $3,000. Um, mine got covered thankfully because this particular doctor is skilled at getting them covered by insurance. Um, but others I think are not. And SIBO like endo is a little bit of a, um, it's a disease that is controversial and that it's mismanaged and misunderstood. And I've since learned that. So I don't really know if I've been, the way I understood it from my gastroenterologist is that I will probably every six months or so have to redo the two week course of antibiotics, which by the way, destroyed me. It made me really sick. Um, and it's hard for me to know if I'm better because I still have the endo in my body. So I don't really know what's what, um, but we will see after my surgery and I will let you know <laughs> if I feel better. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's like a special diet that, you know, can go with that. The what's it called? FOD map diet. Um, I'm still learning a lot about it. And, uh, I'm, I think I'm less invested in caring about that one right now because I'm so honed in on these other things that I have going on, but I think SIBO will, it's something I'll become more intimate with in the, in the near future when I have time to care about it more, I guess. Uh, but I did yeah. do antibiotics in preparation for the surgery because when I have the hysterectomy, essentially, you know, I'm losing my cervix and everything and they're creating what's called a vaginal cuff. So if there's any straining involved when I'm, you know, going to the bathroom, it can actually open the sutures and create, you know, infection and a lot of problems for me. So that scared me enough to say like, all right, just let me take care of this. Um, and then we'll deal with that later. Um, Again, yeah. What I'm appreciating the most about how you're explaining your story is this like one thing at a time. Which of course, when you're in the mi the midst of it, I'm sure it doesn't quite feel like you're handling it all that well. We never really feel like we do, but the one like the way you're explaining it to me again, it just sounds very like, okay, put my head down and do this part, and then I'm gonna do this part, and then I'm gonna do this part, and you're figuring it out as you go. But um, you're allowing for some of that separation because it can just feel so foggy and so confusing. There's this swirling of stuff in your head and we can get paralyzed with fear. I know I've been in that space where it's like, I don't know what to do. So I'm going to do nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, but yeah, I mean, I think that there can be, I definitely feel overwhelmed, especially trying to do my career and take care of two young children and, you know, take care of the house and everything. It's, it is overwhelming. Um, uh, but I think that I've just, yeah, I just kind of had to keep moving um, because the, the, well, the story essentially continues with this surgeon, you know, she has these sort of prerequisites for surgery, one of which well, the SIBO piece, but also um, pelvic floor therapy. So I definitely needed this post babies, like the level of incontinence, like I would sneeze and I was like, well, time to change, or I would try to work out. And it was really challenging for me. And that felt like it really came from childbirth and, and labor and just being pregnant. So, um, so I kind of went in, uh, a little skeptical. I was like, how's this really gonna help me? I mean, is this, you know, really worth it? And, you know, for her, it was a requirement. You had to do eight of these, you know, pelvic floor therapy sessions, um, in order to have the surgery. So I said, okay. 
she said, you know, this pelvic floor therapist in Encinitas is just the best in the world. She's incredible. She was actually her pelvic floor therapist um, because my, this particular doctor also has a history of endo and adenomyosis and also had a full hysterectomy. So she sent me to a woman and I want everybody to write this name down who's anywhere near the area. It's Jandra Mueller. Um, she's a doctor of pelvic floor therapy or DPT. I'm uh, sorry if I butchered that. She is just, I credit her with everything good that has sort of happened in my life since meeting her. And I'm really, even though I'm not working with that surgeon in LA anymore, which I'll get to that part of the story, um, I would never have found, I probably would not have found Jandra because I live about 45 minutes away from there. So it's completely out of my way. But I went to her because it was so high. She came so highly recommended. And then after meeting her, I was like, I would never see anyone else. I mean, she's incredible. She's very smart. She also has endometriosis, um, which she's very public about and has had these surgeries, not the hysterectomy, but the excision surgery. So on top of helping me with all the pelvic floor stuff, which by the way, for anyone who has recently had a baby and is experiencing that, it does work. Um, pelvic floor therapy, the, <laughs> just to kind of circle back, my OBGYN, the one who did the laparoscopy and delivered my babies had also told me um, postpartum that I would just need to have a surgery. She's like the incontinence. Yeah. You can't really do anything about it. Pelvic floor therapy doesn't work. You're probably just going to need the surgery. That's not true. Stop. Yes. Uh, that <laughs> I've so, heard of people not recommending pelvic floor therapy therapy, but I've never heard of someone actively saying it doesn't work. And oh, my pelvic floor therapy, if anyone needs recommendations in Atlanta, just send me an email. I've got a few that I recommend to, um, and I was doing that before my baby was born and after, and I had one moment, my entire pregnancy and postpartum where I beat a little. <laughs> so yeah, other than that, like it pelvic works, floor, people. Yeah. it completely <laughs> reduced my pain with sex in a way that I had no idea was even related to the pain I was having. We kept thinking it was like UTI, but then my test would show up negative, but it was, that's what it felt like. And I'd have micro tears and it was just brutal, mm -hmm. literally like three round, three sessions of pelvic floor therapy. And it was like that and breath work and other stuff, but like oh. pelvic floor therapy all the way. It works and it's not invasive and it's, you know, um, and I just am learning so much about my body, just things I didn't, you know, I just became so much more comfortable with my body um, and understanding what was what in my body that I had never, yeah, I've just never experienced that before. So she has been life-changing. I see her weekly. I, my husband knows, I mean, nothing is going to get in the way of me going to that appointment. If we have a sick child, he stays home so that I can make it to that um, because it's that important to me. And um, it will continue to be a really important part for next steps in my care. So Jandra Mueller, write it down. Um, she's incredible. And um, essentially uh, what happened as I was, you know, I was on track to have my surgery with this other doctor in, in the fall. And um, then because it's all out of pocket and she doesn't take insurance, insurance is really tricky. And my particular insurance has been sort of notoriously known to not cover this procedure. And so if they didn't, cover it, which was pretty likely that that would be the case because she's out of network. I was going to have to pay $33,000 minimum out of pocket two weeks prior to the surgery. So when I learned that, I remember being in my car and I just pulled over to the side of the road and I was just inconsolably crying. And I called my husband and I said, I don't think I can have the surgery. You know, we can't really afford this. And he said, well, we'll just sell our house. <laughs> which I thought, no, we're definitely not going to sell our house. I mean, we're not going to do that. That's, that's insane. Um, and I called my parents and then they offered to, you know, forego doing their remodel so that they could help me cover it, which also just didn't feel like an option for me. Um, my husband's parents also offered to help, um, but I don't really have a relationship with them. Um, so that didn't feel comfortable for me either. So I went back to Jandra um, for an appointment and essentially told her what was happening. And that was the point in time where she recommended to me somebody in San Diego who she had gotten excision surgery from, who she referred to as a unicorn doctor. And 
I am so grateful that I learned about this doctor. She is incredible. She's in San Diego. She takes insurance. Um, her name is Dr. Spring Robinson. She is my surgeon now, and she is not listed on Nancy's Nook. Um, and I won't speak to that because I don't understand that completely, but it sounds like there's possibly something political happening there. Um, I don't really know, but she absolutely should be uh, a doctor that people should see. She's the only doctor I will recommend to any of my patients or my friends um, whenever they're having any sort of symptom related to this, because she is incredible. When I went to her recently, I think this was in early April 5th, I want to say, somewhere in that ballpark. So this is fairly recent. She saw my surgery pictures from 2016. And in other words, she basically said, holy shit. She said, we need to do emergency surgery. She's, and essentially what she told me is that in those photos, which were, I had been explained that it was, you know, stage one, really mild, not a big deal, that it was stage four, deep infiltrating endometriosis, and that my organs are so obliterated that I'm at very high risk of actually needing rectal reconstruction surgery, which explained so many of my symptoms, um, so many, so much of my pain. And my fallopian tubes at that time were completely covered in endo. And as you recall, my doctor told me they were clear. So there was no chance I was going to get pregnant. I spent two years of infertility every month, hoping and, you know, doing anything I could to get pregnant for nothing. I mean, there was no chance it was going to work that way. And my uterus was like, I think she said the words 10 times the size of what it should be. It was a completely different color. Um, yeah, everything's moved to the left. My organs are like probably wrapped around each other from the, all the adhesions that I have. Um, and I just, <laughs> so now I'm, I'm, my surgery got bumped to May 24th. So it's, you know, next Wednesday or not this coming Wednesday, but the next Wednesday. And, um, and I'm going to be, you know, um, bedridden for at least two weeks. Uh, I mean, I'll be able to walk and I'll, I'm being encouraged to walk, but um, I mean, I'm going to need to rest a lot. I won't be able to hold my babies for six to eight weeks um, or lift anything over 10 pounds, which basically renders me useless as a mom, because who do you think does all the grocery shopping and, you know, takes the kids to all their activities. And if I can't lift them safely in and out of car seats, um, you know, then I, I can't be the one, you know, caring for them in those ways. So it's going to disrupt our lives pretty significantly, at least for the next few months. Um, and hopefully, you know, I, I won't know really until that day, whether my ovaries are staying in, um, if they are, you know, obliterated, I lose my, my ovaries, which creates a lot of complications from a hormonal standpoint, which I will have anyways, um, I will be on hormone replacement therapy regardless of the ovaries, but it'll just be, you know, a much different picture without them. So I'm hoping, I mean, it also puts me at higher risk for like heart failure and things like that when you lose your ovaries. So the goal is to keep those in if we can. Um, but, but, you know, TBD on um, what's going on with potential rectal reconstruction surgery, she won't really know until she, she goes in there. Um, but it, it completely explains all of my symptoms for years that I've been having, that I've been told, you know, you're just an anxious person. And it's actually in my file. If you read my notes, it just says, I mean, it denies all my pain. It's, it basically said patient denied pain with sex, patient denied or pain with intercourse, patient denied, you know, this, this, and that. I said, I absolutely didn't deny that. You're, you're denying it um, on my notes. And, um, and it just said, you know, I, all over my files, patient is presenting as very anxious, 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 which of course I'm anxious. I'm in pain. I'm so and I glad you're saying that because I have, I have clients with similar paperwork and to hear somebody else, uh, and, and they, they, they don't have an ending yet that validates that pain and that the anxiety is caused by pain, not the pain is caused by anxiety. So exactly. free to say this, you know, for everyone to hear, I just really, really appreciate yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's um, it makes me so angry. It makes me so angry um, because again, I think this is so important. Um, and I don't say this to sound, you know, 
like braggadocious or pompous in any way, but I am very highly educated. I went to one of the top universities in the world. I have that one of the highest degrees you can have, you know, 1% of the population has a doctoral degree. It didn't matter. It didn't matter how smart I sounded. It didn't matter how much information or education I had or was able to, you know, provide myself in, in these areas. I was made to feel so stupid um, and so, you know, exaggerative. And I honestly, I was thinking about this today, you know, doing this podcast is that I feel like I probably sound, and not just me, but just, just people that are navigating this system. We sound like conspiracy theorists, you know, I'm like, I need my foil hat, you know, we do. We sound ridiculous because we're like, they're not listening to us. They can't get proper care and there's no research and there's only one sentence in medical. And it's like, it's true. But if you're not navigating this, these systems and you don't know that you have these diseases, then you just assume your doctor is really smart and they know what they're talking about. And I think actually the biggest fear I have for my friends and my patients is when they have a really nice doctor. I, and this is going to sound crazy, but hear me out. I have some people in my life right now that I suspect are actually have probably some, some, something. I don't know what it is. I can't, I can't say that. I'm not here to diagnose that. That's, that's me not staying in my lane. Right. But I, I have concerns based on symptoms that are not normal. So I want to say this, if you have pain in anything, that's not normal. If you have pelvic pain, if you cannot have sex without being in pain, if you cannot have a bowel movement without some really ridiculous symptoms, pain, um, you know, whatever, things going on that shouldn't be happening and they're, they're more often happening than not, that's not normal. Um, so if you have a really sweet, compassionate, kind doctor that, you know, maybe delivered your babies or listened to you with this one thing or is really sweet and takes the time with you, I'm worried for you because I can almost guarantee you that that doctor is all those things, which is great because doctors should be that and they should have good bedside manner and they should make you feel heard and listened to and respected. But if they don't have expertise in this area, they are going to make you worse. They're going to put you on medication that you shouldn't be on. You should not be on these medications. They're going to recommend that you get pregnant or that you drink alcohol to calm down or that you take an anti-anxiety medication. And that's great, except that's not going to cure your endometriosis. So you need to fire that doctor or at least for this particular thing and find somebody that actually knows what they're doing and has good success rate removing the endometriosis so that you can live a pain-free, happy, normal life. And so, that's the, what I'm contending with right now is the, as I'm talking to friends about this, like, oh, but I love my doctor, you know, he or she, they're so sweet and I wouldn't want to leave them. And it, it just, it makes me so, uh, I feel overwhelmed, you know, I, I don't want them to go through this. Yeah. I, uh, so my take on that, my, from a therapy perspective is, and you did, you said this too, but keep your doctor, but find in addition to your yearly checkup with that doctor, find somebody who specializes in this because having a relationship with a doctor that you trust, that you like is mm -hmm. important. But when you're struggling to find pieces to the puzzle, you, and you know, your doctor is like, you're saying, they're just kind of kindly, compassionately saying like, oh, like, you know, they're not really giving you a whole lot or referring you to a specialist, then you have to add to your care team. You don't mm -hmm. have to get rid of that doctor, but they've just become your general practitioner and you've got to keep searching for answers. Exactly. And if they are such a kind, you know, thoughtful, um, ethical doctor, then maybe you'll help educate them in this area. And then they will be, you know, another voice for you or another, they'll, they'll be intrigued enough to learn more or at least refer to the proper person. I mean, every doctor I've seen since then, just for other things, I've said, if you have a woman that's having these things, please send them to Dr. Spring Robinson because she's here and she's local and she takes insurance and she's incredible. And she, you know, that's who they should be seeing for this. And I just am throwing her name around because I want people to know about her and to be able to find her because she, she is accessible to lots of different kinds of people, not just, you know, wealthy, educated, you know, women. 
And um, I, I just, it makes me so sad that, uh, that, that so many of these doctors are not accessible. You know, it's like you find these unicorn surgeons, but then they can only help you if you have money. And I just, I don't think that that's okay. Yeah, so. it's, it's a broken system, which I know we've talked about a lot. And I always wish that we could end that sentence with like, here's the solution to this fixing this system. And I've yet to, I've yet to find a way to end on, on that conversation in a way that feels good. Yeah. I can imagine. Well, I think just you doing podcasts like this does really help. And hopefully it's reaching, you know, a large audience and, you know, people can share it with their friends or their family members and help them. You know, I'm sure you're helping a lot of people by, by putting this out there. Not, not my talks per se, but just all the, all the podcasts, all the episodes that you're doing. Um, it's really incredible. Yeah, I, for you. I appreciate that. And, you know, I, this is my, I guess it is, it's my, my privilege um, because I, you know, again, like I'm in a space where I can take the free time to interview people. You know, I don't get paid for this hour. You don't get paid for this hour. Um, and I'm, I'm able to. And so, cause I've, I've, it used to, we know, I think it's an ongoing journey, but the conversation around privilege and access, and it's like, how do I, okay, I, I have a privilege. I have, there's no, I, I don't, can't deny that. And I can't pretend I don't. So how do I use it in the best way that I can? And so far, this is the way that I know how. Um, with my own energy levels and what's important to me and, and what is meaningful to me, this seems to check all those boxes. Um, and so I'm always really grateful again to people who come on like you and talk about it um, so we can just be collaborative in this. Mm -hmm. One thing I, I wanted to take a second just to say too, because I think a lot of people in my life right now have been trying to figure out how to support me through this. And I think uh, there are so many sort of platitudes and silver linings that people want to sort of force on me about this, that um, I don't, I don't want, I mean, I never want toxic positivity. Um, I, I like to complain. <laughs> I think complaining is like healthy and honest. It can be annoying um, if you're, you know, if you're not doing anything about it, but I'm, I'm a complainer who also does, I act on things and I take care of things, but just let me, let me bemoan and begrudge a system that is, you know, misogynistic, racist, and like you said, broken. Um, because, you know, I think the squeaky wheel gets the oil or as they say, right. And so I like to be squeaky. Um, I think that anger is, such a healthy valid emotion obviously it's a secondary emotion and what lies beneath it is right pain and sadness and grief and i think um that is exactly how i should be feeling in this moment i'm about to go through something really painful um scary uh risky it's going to change my life significantly in some ways for the better but possibly in other ways um it will create new challenges um and possibly change my quality of life and in a, in a sort of negative way. Uh, and, and that wasn't because I wasn't trying to take care of, I mean, I, I did all the right things and it didn't matter. And so let me be angry about that. And if my anger is not something that can be tolerated, then um, I think then that those are sort of the people right now that I, <clears throat> how do I want to say this? I don't know. I think that it's, I've been met with a lot of the, well, but you're not going to be in bed for more than two weeks as if two weeks isn't a long time to be in bed anyways, or, you know, not being able to hold my kids for nearly two months and pick them up. Like that is, especially for how young they are, that is not just really hard on them, but also on me to not be able to just like be, be a mom and care for them the way they need to be cared for. They're very young and they, they need to be picked up and held and they need to, you know, and I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, and I have anger about that. And um, sorry, I'm, I'm carefully 
I, I'm sort of thinking as I'm speaking. So I want to be mindful of that. Uh, I think that right now I'm very drawn to being with people that have compatible responses to the situation that I'm, I'm going through. And I think other ways that people can be helpful when someone's navigating a big surgery or just these kinds of things, uh, you know, the meal train thing is, is, is an extremely valuable. If you're not someone that can, is great at validating or empathy or not sort of jumping to like, let's look at the positive thing and sort of, you know, being Pollyanna, um, that's okay. Um, meals are really comforting or, um, you know, helping with the kids or helping with grocery shopping or um, little tasks like that, that really, that, that really can go a long way. And that is um, really meaningful as well and, and very valuable. So um, cleaning, cleaning your bathroom. <laughs> yes. It's like, please come over. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> will ever ask you to clean their bath. Like when, when we're postpartum when we're sick after mm -hmm. surgery I'm never going to ask a family member to come clean my bathroom so please just offer and just do it <laughs> you know who does do that in my life so I have to give her credit because she'll probably listen to uh, it. excuse me my mother my mother does clean my bathroom in these moments and yes I okay good really appreciate it because it's true it's just yeah it's hard to do when you're not well um and it's necessary right you need things to be sanitary and clean for for you and for your family so um, I just, I did just want to sort of say, say that because I think, um, I'm just kind of looking at my notes because I'd written a few notes that I wanted to sort of say, um, I think, yeah, I just think that that toxic positivity re gut reaction that people have, because I think they want you to feel better and they, and I think they also want to feel better. I think it's uncomfortable to sit in that discomfort and, Obviously, as a psychologist, I have a much higher capacity and willingness to be able to do that. And I think that it's it's challenging when a lot of people in your life don't sort of have that because it can feel extremely lonely um, and very dismissive of what you're going through. And it's not the intention ever. I know that, but the impact remains. And the impact is what I'm always really honed in on more than your intent because your intentions are probably always going to be pretty good. But if your impact isn't, then it's worth maybe shifting or at least finding other ways to be supportive for people that, you know, don't require you to dismiss their feelings that are super valid. Um, it's true. It's true. There's such a, we're, um, where did I just hear this? We're just a grief phobic society. And I cannot remember exactly again, where I just heard that to credit them, but we're grief phobic. And so, you know, people, especially if they're not the ones having to deal with it. Um, I don't even, again, I don't think it's conscious and I know their intention is, is well meaning, but as soon as they start to feel the grief pop up in their own body before they can even consciously be aware of it, they're like, nope, nope, everything's going to be okay. And yeah, it's isolating because we don't have that privilege to be able to say, yeah, everything's going to be fine. And I can, it's like, no, we have to sit our bot we have to sit in our body every single day and wonder about what's going to happen so it's just nice to have somebody else who can be in it with you mm -hmm. yeah and I wanted to just in sort of um to honor the work that you're doing um I I heard this quote recently and it wasn't about this in particular um but it, it feels applicable so I wanted to share it with you if that's okay um so it's uh it was stated by uh, a person named Alok Vaidmenon. I'm not sure if you know of Alok. They are an internationally acclaimed author, poet, comedian, and just public speaker. Um, and they recently said, there is magic in being seen by people who understand. It gives you permission to keep going. And I feel like you do that um, by having this podcast and sort of giving uh, a voice to so many people and helping them sort of be understood and be seen. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, a, it's just been, I think, like I said earlier, a beautiful project um, to connect, to connect with each other. Um, you know, obviously I have my own experiences too, and they're different and talking to all types of different people and every single story, whether it's exactly, whether it's the exact same diagnosis and similar undertones like there's just something different to be learned in everyone's story so 
And what I appreciate most too, because as therapists, we're really trained to be a blank slate and not share much with our clients. And so um, just being, just having therapists come on and share their own story is just, it's just beautiful. Um, We can, I think it makes us better clinicians and you have more of a, an ability to connect with your clients. And of course you still have to, you know, be careful of transference, counter-transference and all that stuff, but you have to do that anyway. Right. So, um, yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. Is there anything else that you wrote down or that you've been thinking about that feels important to expand Um, on? Yeah. I, I'm looking. Well, I was, <laughs> I don't know if this is, you might cut this out because it might be ridiculous, but I was sort of revisiting. I don't know if you've ever read, I'm sure when you were in, you know, junior high or high school or something like Plato's allegory of the cave. It's like a philosophy. I didn't okay. read that one. No. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not going to, I will not, I am not a philosopher, so I will not explain it, but for people that want to read it, but essentially there's like prisoners that are in a cave and then you know, they spend their whole lives in there. So that's sort of all they know. And I think they're like looking at their own shadows on the wall of the cave. And that's significant for some reason, but there's a few that managed to, I think, escape. And um, the whole notion is that the, the people that come back to be like, Hey, there's like this whole other world out here. (laughs) Did you know, come out here and look, they, um, the, the idea is that sort of like the other prisoners that stayed in the cave would either like try to kill those people who are trying to kind of free them because they wouldn't want to leave kind of the safety and comfort of their known world. And that made me think of people that are navigating medical conditions and navigating the health system is like, they have information and experiences now that have shown them a different world than what so many people know and understand. And when they try to explain that to people, people don't they're not ready to hear it because it's just feels scary to think about, oh, my doctors that I'm trusting maybe don't know as much as they think that they do, or maybe they don't care as much as they should, or, you know, a variety of, of things that people might feel when you're sort of planting doubt, seeds of doubt in, in this world that feels safe to some people. Uh, so I, I don't know why, but I felt inclined to kind of share that because it stayed with me. And I thought, yeah, that's kind of how I feel right now. Like, I'm like, I want to free everyone. I want everybody to know and to, to get the proper care for endometriosis. And I'm, I'm worried that they're not. And I, I, I'm, I like want them to change who they're going to see and all these things. And I realized in doing that, that I'm sort of, that that is a little bit, um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, uh, words are not coming to me by the way fogginess is a symptom of endometriosis (laughs) brain fog which i've also since learned which makes a lot of sense but um it's i think it's uh it just shakes the their their foundation um and that is scary people don't want to think about the world that way right they want to feel safe and trustworthy and so when someone comes in and says it's not ah listen to me that's where that you know conspiracy theorists thing kind of comes up is like this, you know, the crazy lady on the street again, yelling about endometriosis. I feel like that's who I'm becoming. I'm gonna have like signs on my garage, you know, <laughs> you need like vision surgery. Ah. So, um, isn't it, yeah. it is when you are one of few that have experienced something again, it's isolating and it makes you question your own experience to, to a certain extent. Um, And again, that's another reason why I do this podcast, because the whole goal is to demystify the therapy process for people with chronic illness. Like our goal as a therapist, especially because people have been, oh, this is all in your head, go see a therapist. It's like, uh, actually, this is actually very much in your body. And now as a therapist who has lived experience and a lot of additional training around chronic illness and the mind-body connection, I can help you navigate this system in a much different way and create safety pillars along the way. I mean, that's a big, that's a big piece of somatic experiencing and and just trauma therapy in general is that we're always creating safety before we say, Hey, go out of the cave. It's like, you know, it's interesting as you were saying, like the Plato's and the cave and the shadows, I was like, "Mm, the shadows are a resource. You probably would take your shadow along with you in order to do a journey like that so that you can feel the familiarity and the safety of the cave, which was all you've known, you need your shadow. So take it with you. 
um, as you kind of go out into the world and try to expand your worldview. Well, and as you were saying this, it's a really important point came up because I also want, I want to hold my field accountable as well because I've really been coming at, you know, um, medical doctors today. Um, and thanks for still listening, guys. <laughs> um, but I also want to come for uh, the field of psychology because I mean, holy cow, where did most of these problematic ideas about women in hysteria come from? They came from Freud and others and his, you know, colleagues. And they have, I'm, I'm, it's insane how long that they, they have managed to, you know, um, hang around in this really dangerous, uh, misogynistic, disgusting way. Um, but psychologists, I mean, when, when I was navigating this pain, I mean, I did go to couples therapy um, to, to work through some of the, you know, sexual dysfunction that was happening. And not once did anyone think to say, Hey, have you had your hormones tested? <laughs> like, let's start there before we dive into whatever might be going on from a emotional standpoint or psychological standpoint. Cause it turns out I have no testosterone zero. And a lot of that's because of the endo, because it's so high in estrogen um, and it's also normal for women with endo to not want to have sex and to have low libido one because of the estrogen, but also obviously because of the pain. Um, but I mean, the hormone thing, it's, it, it is such an easy, it was like a, a blood, a prick, of, you know, blood. And, and then you sort of find that out and nobody thought to do that all these years that I was like, Hey, I think something's wrong. Like just drink some wine. I'm like, great. Thanks for trying to make me an alcoholic. I don't think that's going to help my situation. Um, also, alcohol is a depressant. It also creates a lot of other problems. I'm sure I would imagine uh, dehydration, which probably doesn't help with lubrication, which is an important part of like healthy sexual functioning. Um, but I digress. I just felt like I wanted to say I was also failed by my own field. And I imagine I have or will also fail people in these areas. Um, as a doctor of psychology, I know that um, I have probably created harm unknowingly. Um, and so I, I just want to say that this is, it doesn't end, it doesn't start and sort of end with the medical field, like the, the field of psychology and we as therapists and all these different disciplines, whether it's acupuncturists, et cetera, because a lot of them that I went to also didn't know anything about endo. And of course not, they can't know about everything. But I think if you don't know about something, it's just important to say that. I don't know about this. Let me get you to someone who knows a lot about it. You know? Well, you know, as a society, we do believe like physical stuff is a manifestation of your mental, emotional state. And in other cultures, it's the exact opposite. If you have depression or anxiety, it's like, oh, what's wrong with your body? And they, they target it from that way. And I think that that could also miss the mark on a lot of ways too. So it's just, I just love that we are kind of going into this kind of like functional medicine is a lot more kind of East and West combined. And that's where I have felt there's a lot of pitfalls in that field as well at every field. Right. Oh, um, so but I, fun. I do definitely just being able to, and this is where your education becomes, you know, it, it is a privilege in a sense too, to be able to take all this information and then differentiate for yourself, figure out what's right and what's wrong. Like that takes time. That takes energy. It takes education. So again, this podcast, your story, like it's just, you have to constantly be picking up pieces and, you know, the alcohol thing, I, I really wanted to say this earlier too, when you were mentioning it and it's like, women are so taught to not feel pleasure mm. from religious standpoints, from patriarchal standpoints, from every system, it, it is terrified of female pleasure. So it finds ways to reduce that. And, you know, I have a lot of women that I work with, and this was my own experience too, um, trying to kind of figure out how to have sex without alcohol. Like, mm -hmm. and we could do a whole other podcast on that, but you know, in your younger twenties, if you drank, um, not, I do know some people that didn't, but a lot of us do. And it was like, oh yeah, well, you know, how did, how did you, how do you feel pleasure? How do you get turned on? Well, I don't, I don't know. Cause like I would have four drinks before I'd have sex. Right. right. Well, and, and see, it's funny you're saying that because I actually didn't drink in my 20. I didn't drink ever until I was 25. So that was the other piece of things is that I was being recommended alcohol. And I was like, but I don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hadn't had like a sip of alcohol until I turned 25. And so there was that too. I'm like, can I get maybe a recommendation that feels a little more <laughs> appropriate for what I'm able to 
take on here. Um, but yes, but to your point, I mean, that was just, sorry, a digression there, but yeah. No, it's important. Yeah. Right. Either, and either what it tells me is either way, it was bad advice because if I'm a drinker, don't tell me to continue drinking to get rid of my pain like that. I'm already at a risk for alcoholism. And exactly. if I'm not a drinker, then it's just totally out of alignment with me and my lifestyle. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. It's just, but to your point, yes, women's pleasure. I, there's a, actually, there was a, an interview that Madonna did about this. I, a long time ago, probably in the nineties. And I don't remember who the guy was that interviewed her, but I mean, classic, right. Just male that was sort of talking about how disgusting her videos were. I think she did a music video where she's, you know, masturbating or it's not, it's, she's insinuating that she's going to, or that she is. I don't remember exactly even what video it is. I mean, it's Madonna. So it was probably every video, but she said something, she just responded in this way. She was almost smiling, which kudos to her. Cause I cannot, but she just said, uh, why are you so afraid of my pleasure? Something, something, I don't want to butcher her words. Uh, it's worth sort of Googling that interview, but it was, it just really stayed with me. And to your point, I mean, you know, a 90 plus year old man um, could go in and say, Hey, I'm having trouble having sex. And listen, I'm not here to say a 90 plus year old man shouldn't enjoy sex. Like you enjoy it all the way. You deserve that. But I was, you know, in my early twenties and I was being told like, eh, you'll be fine. You know, you're just nervous. Uh, and there's not, you know, a Viagra for women. Um, it's testosterone, which by the way, isn't FDA approved for women. So it's not covered by insurance. And it's the only thing I can take right now to supplement, to have actual testosterone in my system, which is a necessary hormone to have, um, to experience pleasure and to, um, I'm sure a number of other things. And, uh, so I have to pay out of pocket. So again, this is only accessible to certain people, certain populations of people. And um, as if testosterone is something that only male males have. Precisely. Like, like women, just like men have estrogen, women have testosterone. And also let's just talk about the fact that we're speaking about things on like a very binary, you know, male binary. versus women. There's all kinds of things in between, right? Like intersex people and non-binary and, you know, so everything I'm saying today, I, I think I use the word women a lot. And I hope that, that it's just known that I'm, when I'm saying that word, I'm including, you know, um, everybody sort of under that umbrella. Cause I just, I, I want to make sure I'm being inclusive too. Um, and when I say I work with, you know, women with chronic medical conditions, um, that includes everyone. So that interview you just heard was from a few months ago, and the follow-up to Dr. Anna's story is coming right now. It's another 10, well, another 15 minutes or so, uh, and it was recorded just this week. So I hope you enjoy. Yeah, so uh, I talk about this at length, you know, over two hours probably on uh, another podcast um, called I Care Better, which is a really good resource for anyone that listens to your podcast who wants to know more about endometriosis and, you know, related illnesses that often accompany endometriosis. So I recommend that to all the listeners. And I hadn't mentioned that in our last, uh, in, you know, the beginning part of this episode. So that's a great uh, resource to know. And yes, I, um, I was, really surprised by how well I felt immediately after surgery areas of my body that have been in pain probably for the, you know, the, the majority of the last, I don't know, 20 or so years, um, they were immediately gone, which is pretty incredible. When you think about the fact that I had, you know, inc excision surgery, a pretty uh, for, you know, deep infiltrating endo and it's stage four endo and uh, a hysterectomy, you know, you'd sort of imagine that you'd be bedridden or in quite a bit of pain. And I certainly was the minute I woke up from surgery um, and they gave me Dilaudid. And then after that, I never felt that pain again. Uh, I definitely stayed on top of my Tylenol and Advil, which is all I ended up needing to take, which was also surprising to me. Um, and after two days, I was off of everything, which I was not expecting. Um, yeah. And I was and, you know, I've actually felt so well that it was a little bit dangerous because it made, it sort of gave me this impression that 
I could do more than what I should was allowed to actually do right. Post-surgery, you can't lift anything more than 10 pounds. Um, so my children groceries, you know, lots of things. And, um, you know, you need to take it easy. You obviously can't have sex. You can't go in any body of water other than a shower, um, you know, for risk of infection and things like that. So other than those things, which were, you know, minor inconveniences, I, um, I, I did so well. Um, I think the, the, since then, um, it's been, what, what I'm sort of realizing is that, that this is going to be a process. I think it felt so amazing to feel so good right away and pain-free. Um, but it, it's not just pain, right? Like there's so many things that accompany, you know, these diseases. And in, in my particular case, um, you know, the lack of testosterone and I was able to keep my ovaries. Cause I think I keep forgetting we recorded this right before my surgery. So I know there was the fear of, you know, my losing organs, what's going to happen. So I had a partial hysterectomy, was able to keep um, my ovaries, it's the only thing, I, you know, I kept, um, the cervix, the fallopian tubes, and obviously the uterus, all of that was removed. Um, my uterus was so enormous that she had to cut it in half to actually get it out of my body. Um, yeah. And then, um, as far as the other concerns we had, I got very lucky that nothing else needed to be sort of removed. She was able to remove all of the disease um, I really trust her. She's an incredible surgeon. Again, that's Dr. Spring Robinson. She's in San Diego for anyone who's close to Southern California or can afford to travel. Uh, she, I couldn't recommend her more. Um, in terms of like the process that I was sort of telling you about, a lot of that is the hormonal piece. And I was put on systemic testosterone following the surgery by a different doctor who handles all of my my hormone related things. And like, she's also a sex medicine doctor. So she's the one that's really helping me through that piece of the puzzle. Um, her name is Dr. Alyssa Yi. also really highly recommend. Um, and you know, we, we were on systemic testosterone and my body, the way it metabolizes things, it's just, you know, every body is so different. And I think this was a really helpful reminder to me about that, right. That particularly things that are not FDA approved for women, which is systemic testosterone. They don't have like any studies on the amount and things like that. So what ended up happening is that I, I used the recommended amount, but it ended up uh, increasing my levels 10 times over the, over what they had been initially. And then three times over the limit of what they should be, which meant, which, which equals that I was, I felt completely out of control, rage and, um, depression and anxiety. And I was really impossible to be around. I didn't even want to be around myself. <laughs> you know, it's like that horrible feeling of, I want to get out of my body and take a vacation and like leave that satanic woman, you know, in there by herself. It was really awful. And then once I figured out that that's what it was, I was taken off of that. We are, we took about a three week, four week break, retesting, and then we'll kind of start again with much smaller doses. Um, the other thing she put me on, and I definitely wanted to alert people to this because it's very cool. I hadn't known about it. There is a drug for women um, who have, you know, no or very low libido and are wanting, right, to increase that. Um, and it's called Addy. It's spelled A-D-D-Y-I. Um, that is... I just started it about two weeks ago. So it's too early to tell. I can't really give you an update in terms of how it's making me feel, but I will tell you that the testosterone really helped <laughs> while I was on those insane levels. I definitely felt, you know, like feelings and desires that I hadn't felt in so, so, so long. So that gave me a lot of hope between those two things. I think that I'm headed in the right direction. Um, I think one thing for people that are going through a hysterectomy um, and, and someone who's possibly had, you know, sex related issues um, as well, it can feel, I think, very scary to dive back into that and try that after you've, you know, had all this done to your body um, and, you know, you don't have a cervix anymore. It's replaced by what's called a vaginal cuff. And I think for me, there's still a bit of like a fear there of what's this going to feel like and am I going to feel pain? And so there's a bit of avoidance still that's happening. And I wanted to really give my body 
more time just to heal and not rush into that. So again, I don't have updates in that department of my life, but um, I feel hopeful and I hadn't felt hopeful in the longest time. So I think that's pretty exciting. Yeah, Um, that's really exciting. And I think hopefulness is often to just a sign that yeah, you know, things are, things are going right. Like we can be, um, that hopefulness helps us get there too. Right. So it's like, it's bi-directional. We need some positive things to happen to bring hope. And then hope kind of makes the good things happen more. And it can be, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like just work off of each other. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I think, you know, the other piece is just that this is really a lifelong, this isn't a cure. I mean, in, in the majority of cases, most women do not need another surgery, but a lot of that is also up to them, right? And how they manage their, you know, life afterwards. And it's really a lifestyle change. And that part has been a challenge for me as far as avoiding anti-inflammatory, you know, uh, inflammatory foods um, or foods that cause inflammation and um, living sort of an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, Cause that's so many of the things that I love, right? Sugar, coffee, you know, a glass of wine, um, you know, just carbs, <laughs> pasta. I don't know all the things that anyway. not, you know, that probably impact my body and can create endo to begin with. So I'm just sort of recognizing, I think, I think I knew this cognitively, but now I'm really living it. And I'm recognizing that this is going to be a process with probably some highs and lows and moments that, um, I get frustrated with myself. Um, and then moments where, you know, I'm really sticking to my goals. Um, and I think I'm just trying to accept that and not be perfect and just allow myself to kind of navigate, you know, this life, right. Post-surgery. Um, I pelvic floor therapy is an ongoing thing. It will probably be a big part of my life for the majority of my life, which I'm happy about because I absolutely love my pelvic floor therapist. Um, she's fantastic. And I mentioned her as well. She's Jandra Mueller. Um, and she's actually the host of this podcast that I mentioned um, for, again, anybody local. Um, she's, she's wonderful. So those are kind of the things that I'm, wrestling with figuring out still. Um, but as far as pain, um, you know, that feels, um, it's just, it's, it's an incredible feeling to, to live a a fairly pain-free life. Um, at least for now. And again, that can shift, I imagine, um, as you know, depending on my habits. Um, and yeah, I think that's also really helped, you know, depression and anxiety. I just feel, so much better. And I, I can't recommend, you know, going to a, a, a good excision surgeon. Um, I think that's so important. It's very hard to find one, uh, a resource for that is the I care better website. Nancy's nook as well is, is, is helpful. But I think as far as the video vetting that I care better performs, I have, I feel more secure utilizing that. Um, particular organization. Um, so yeah, those are kind of my, I don't know. I wonder if you have other questions for me. I'm sort of yeah. going on. Think, so yeah, the me. only other question, I, no, no, that was great. I think it's, it's just good to hear even, you know, things that people don't think about, um, the hormones you have to go on after and like the fact that women are not tested or or it's not FDA approved. And so we don't quite know exactly what the right dose is and that there is still a bit of a trial and error in a lot of these processes. I think that's a big part, a big theme of this podcast is that just about everything, honestly, in life and in chronic illness is a lot of trial and error. Mm -hmm. And in that process, there's a lot of injustice. And then there's also just a lot of like, there wasn't an injustice done, but this still just didn't work out well and we have to figure out how to navigate that. And so that's kind of what I'm always gathering from these, from these experiences that people share with me. And, um, I think, yeah, just, I'm curious if there are any other lifestyle things. So eating kind of Mm anti-inflammatory, um, pelvic floor therapy, what are some of the other things for you anyway, that were recommended lifestyle wise? Yeah, great question. So exercise, um, 
and, you know, some sort of like mindfulness or meditation or yoga or things that whatever your way of relaxing and feeling somewhat grounded. And that looks different for so many people. And some people really don't like meditation. I'm one of those people. I'm just really bad at it. Um, but I, you know, just anything that you can do to really sort of, you know, find some peace, calm yourself. I think massages, you know, regular massages will be important. Things like acupuncture can really help. It's so case by case because, you know, the way endo presents and, you know, in each body is so different. And there are so many people with endo that have the amount of comorbidities that some of these women navigate. I just, it, it amazes me. And I see that a lot in my work. Um, in particular, but it's, it's pretty incredible to me. So in those cases, they probably, those, those types of patients have a lot more on their plate, I think, than I do at this point. But, um, but those are some of the, the most kind of recommended things and just really good, you know, multidisciplinary care, right? If you have a surgeon that you love or a doctor that's working with you on one thing, you know, you need to, um, make sure that they can communicate and, you know, that no one's stepping on the other's toes. Um, I think gastro, a gastroenterologist will be important. That's something that I've had to add to my life. And that's mainly because of the SIBO that I was diagnosed with, which I'm still figuring out. Um, And I, it's not a high priority for me at the moment, I think, because I just have so much to take care of that I'm kind of like, okay, I know I have SIBO and I have to deal with that. And that has some a lot of inconsistencies in the, you know, in, in the medical community. So it's, it's a little difficult to navigate, I think, because I, you, you read one thing and then you read something that completely contradicts that from two seemingly reputable sources, which is probably so common for your listeners, right? That, that, that is what is so frustrating and, you know, rage inducing because how, how do you know which direction to take and if you're making the right choice? And so, those are kind of the ongoing struggles. And I, I anticipate those to be ongoing for, for a long time. So I've, I'm just kind of in a place of trying to accept that and figure out how to, you know, live a fairly balanced, well-rounded life. And I don't have the answers yet, but I'm taking it one day at a time. And I think that has felt more manageable for me. Yeah, no, that. All of that is, yeah, right up the alley of this podcast. We do talk a lot about all of that. So I just really appreciate you sharing your story. It, it just goes ha- like completely aligned with with everything we talk about. Um, Yeah, it's hard making these decisions, these lifestyle decisions, especially when there's like differing opinions on what you should and shouldn't do. And it's it's complicated, but it is. You know, we did talk a lot in our last episode too, just about support. And that's again, what we talk about on this podcast, like how do we find the support that's right for us? Cause that is such an individualized process. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for sharing an update. I'm excited to air this episode. Um, anything else come to mind for you? Just as just oddly enough, I forgot to mention therapy <laughs> and I'm a psychologist, <laughs> so I should probably say that therapy also can be very helpful and important piece of the puzzle, right? Just to, to, to work with somebody who has an area of expertise in chronic medical conditions or health psychology so that you can also get support from them as you're navigating difficult doctors or difficult decisions. Um, so yeah, sorry, that was, that yeah, was no, absolutely. the way I made it forget <laughs> that one. Yeah. And just, you know, for, um, listeners, like you can always email me and ask, uh, if I know anyone in your state, I've had people email me and Mm -hmm. I I will one day get a directory together, but that's on the back burner for now. (laughs) Yeah, no, I know it's a lot. You have a lot on your plate, but for endo related patients listening, um, the, the, the best directory at the, at the moment I'd say is I care better. So that is a great resource for them and they can look for people in their state. And there's a lot of work that's expanding in that particular area. So I think, I hope endo patients feel a little more hopeful um, that they'll, you know, they'll have better access to care soon. Um, I'm yeah. And if, it's a, if they have a therapist direct, yeah, directory, or is that, is that what you're saying? Like for talk therapy? So I'm actually the person working on that <laughs> at the okay. moment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was the the director of, of, of this organization or the the founder, I should say. Um, heard heard me on the podcast and and reached out to me. So I'm currently working to find, we're starting with California 
just because that's where I am and I know all the laws there. And then we will, the, the goal is to expand that, you know, throughout the country and be able to help people find access to therapists specifically, but the surgeons are on there and pelvic floor therapists, and Perfect. it's an ongoing effort to keep recruiting more people. So if anyone listening um, is a provider that specializes in this, um, whether they specialize in endo, um, you can fill out an application, you can, you know, reach out and, and, um, and I encourage anyone to do that. Absolutely. That's great. Amazing. Well, definitely let me know when that directory, keep me updated and, and I'll share that email list as well. I definitely will. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to putting this out and yeah, we'll keep in touch. Thank you, Destiny. Thanks for taking the time to interview me again. I appreciate you. Absolutely.